Gospel City. I am your host, Candace Sapia, and Gospel City is brought to you by Faith Broadcasters Networks. Um, live from typically Faith Studios and Faith Events in the Bronx, New York. Faith Studios is your go-to um, for all your photography and broadcasting needs, and Faith Events is your one-stop shop for all your event space and decor necessities. Um, it has been a while since I've been here to join you, but it's always a blessing, and I'm very happy to kick off 2023 still in the grace of the FBN and the Gospel City family. If you're tuning in now, please send this link to somebody you feel like might benefit from today's conversation. Today's conversation is centered around starting well, and to all of us that may have different meanings, but in the spirit of the beginning of a new year and beginning of a new month, um, just new beginnings in general. I think it's important to reflect on what we see as performing well and how to just be mindful of that as we go through our day to day. Um, and today to help us have that conversation is the very awesome, the very knowledgeable, the very intelligent Apostle William Shelders. Um, and he's joining us virtually as well. So I'm looking forward to having this conversation with the Apostle Shelters um, and getting to pick his brains and see what we can learn or take away from this conversation about starting well. Um, yeah, I hope you've all been doing well. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, and I hope that the year 2023 is a year full of blessings and grace for all of us. So please stick around for this conversation, invite a friend, and make sure you have your questions ready, um, as I will be looking through the Facebook chat, as always, um, and making sure this conversation is as engaging and as um, thoughtful or encompassing as possible. But yes, God bless you, and thank you for joining. We will have Apostle Shelders on very soon. God bless you, Sister Candace. It's good to uh, be here tonight. <laughs> How are you, Apostle Shelders? It's been a minute. Happy New Year. I hope everything Happy is New well. Year. Yes. Happy, Happy saw, New Year to you. Yeah. I saw somebody, I think like they're like, Ga they're African, they're not Ghanaian. They made a joke about like, oh, how like people can go like, until like Valentine's Day saying Happy New Year, but you know, you don't see people often. So it's still technically a new year, right. I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess it's only been one week, but how has the start of your year been so far? I don't, well, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I, I tell people Merry Christmas every day and they're like, it's not Christmas. <laughs> Well, it is Christmas when uh, you have a clear vision from God and you're walking in purpose. Yeah. Every day has to be Christmas. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be December. Every day is Christmas to me. So, yes, um, it's been just a week. But I must say the year has been awesome. And it's just a reflection of how the rest of the days of the year will look like. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we bless God for it. Yes. Amen. I was going to say like last week I was kind of confused I feel like it's been a while since the first Sunday of the year has fallen like the first day of the January 1st will be a Sunday so it's like you did 31st night service you started church and the right. same thing for Carol's night into Christmas and I couldn't remember I feel like it was the first time it had happened for some reason even though like I know it should have happened at least once before but like I think that like that also is just like 
it was just a calming place to start like the year like consistently and so i think right. like that is even a sign of how this year will go but yeah praise god um yes amen um <laughs> But I guess we'll get right into the questions I have here. Um, and like, there's not a lot going on, so we can like freestyle this as much as possible, as much as you're comfortable with, because I know you've seen the questions, but I guess we'll start with the first question, which is what does it mean to start well? And like your knowledge, or if you were explaining it to somebody who wanted to start well, how would you explain it to somebody for them to understand? Um, good question. Thank you, Sister Candice, for having me. Um, how do we start well? It's, for me, a loaded question. You know, even though it sounds so simple, you know, um, Bible makes very clear that it's not even the beginning of a thing that matters, but the end. And so uh, the question, you know, rephrasing it, you know, what does it mean to start well? You know, uh, how about what does it mean to, you know, end well? <laughs> because you could start well, but if you don't end well, what is the point? And, you know, for me, it is more about uh, how we're going to end. Because where we want to end will determine how we start. I don't think anybody would just go to Penn Station in New York City and jump on any bus. They would jump or start their journey on the kind of bus that would take them to their destination. And so for me, um, you know, starting well, it's you being able to determine where you want to end. Because if I don't know where, you know, to end or where I plan to end, then I am starting on the wrong note. And obviously, if I'm, I'm, I'm starting on the wrong note, then of course, it's evident that the end is not going to be well for me. So for me, starting well is being able to discover your vision, your purpose. Where do I intend to end? Where do I intend to go? Because that should be the basis upon which you start pursuit. So I hope that helps somebody that is tuning in this evening. Yes. Um, I really like what you said. You said starting well starts with like being able to identify your purpose. So I guess for the sake of this conversation, how do you, how does like maybe one get started with that? I feel like maybe we've had this conversation before, but yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so just so I get understanding of the question you asked, if you could repeat that. Um, so just now you were saying like, part of starting well is understanding how to end well and you can't end well until you understand your purpose or your vision right but even Correct. in that i guess there's a process in figuring out or identifying pieces and bits of your vision so i guess i was just trying to understand with like in that how do you start making work to like actually identify what it is what what your purpose is or what your vision is so that you can begin to see what that ending would look like in the first place so, so this is this is where I I begin to tell people, you know, the fact that our purposes are threefold. Mm -hmm. um, when I say your purposes are threefold, it it simply means that the Lord placed you here on the earth to fulfill purposes that are in three clear areas. And, and so, I'm going to take a minute to explain what I mean by you having purpose in three clear areas. The, the first one I want to talk about is your spiritual purpose. Everybody has a spiritual purpose. And, and specifically, if you're a Christian, you should know that there is a purpose for you given by God spiritually that you need to discover so as to fulfill. And so, um, if you read the story in the Garden of Eden, as a matter of fact, it, it makes it even simpler in the Garden of Eden. The fact that Bible says there were uh, five trees in the garden. And um, I, of course, there were many trees in the Garden of Eden, but five of them were, you know, specifically mentioned in Scripture. And each of them was supposed to 
identify something unique in our lives. In fact, two of them we know, you know, because uh, there is so much spoken about it. One of them, Bible calls the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know what happened to that. The Lord said, you could have any other tree in this garden, but make sure that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you have nothing to do with it. And we know what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. It was you get into a place of having things your own way. And God never intended for you and I, all of us, to have things our own way, but rather do things our own way that aligns with the will of God. It means we cannot do that till we discover the will of God for ourselves. And that was a tree that was in a garden. And then also Bible says there, were tree, there, was, there was a tree in the center, the middle of the garden called the tree of life. If you remember, after they rebelled against God and ate of the tree, God told them not to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Bible says God took them out of the garden of Eden so they don't go eat of the tree of life. Now, we must understand the tree of life in the middle of the garden represented Jesus himself. So the Lord didn't want us to remain in sin and still have Jesus. You had Jesus, you had to let go of sin. So he had to remove them because they were in a sinful state at that time. I'm wondering, I know you're wondering, where is he taking this to? Your purpose was right there in the garden when God created us. Now, the tree of life, remember when Jesus came, he said, I'm the tree, ye are the branches. Not only did he say, I'm the tree, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It means the tree of life in the middle. Everything else revolved around it was Jesus represented right there in the middle of the garden. And God wanted man, gave man access to go have fellowship with Jesus, which reveals man's relationship spiritually with God. So what that means is that God has a purpose for you spiritually. What is it that God wants you to do in ministry? What is it that God has called you to do spiritually? So I want to find out that even as a new season begins, how do I start? Well, if I don't know what God wants me to do, I would begin to copy people. I would begin to see, as a pastor, I would see pastors preach a certain way. I would preach like them. As a, a musician, a worship leader, I see people singing a certain way. I want to sing like them. I want to be like everybody else because what they are doing looks enticing. It looks beautiful, and I want to be like them. But then when you read the book of Galatians chapter 5, one of the works of the flesh, Bible says not to do, is called <laughs> emulation. So he talks about fornication, adultery, and all these things. And one thing we don't talk about is emulation. To emulate simply means to copy. God doesn't want you to copy anybody's purpose. He wants you to discover your purpose for your life. And until you find your purpose, you are not starting well because you are living another person's life. Now, again, in the Garden of Eden, two other trees are mentioned. Trees good for food. Anytime God talks about food, he's talking about career. Because Bible says, he that does not work, the same must not eat. Eat what? Food. It means food has a connection with your career. Bad job, bad food. You have a good job, you will have good food. It means if you have no job, you can put no food on the table. It means there is a connection. And God gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to have an encounter with a tree good for food. It means there are certain trees that are not good for food. In that same way, God created you for a particular career, a particular job, a particular business, a particular investment. All these things are even tied. If you're a teenager, you are still going to school, a young adult, a youth, it means even the course you are studying in school, at that point, you should be able to discover what is it that God wants me to do eventually in the area of career or business, which must be connected with even the courses I take in college. So all these things are interconnected. And then again, Bible talks about a tree pleasing to the eyes. When you come to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this is the way Paul puts it. The desire of the unmarried is to please the Lord. And the desire of the married wife is to please the husband. And so right there in the Garden of Eden, there was a tree pleasing to the eyes. That has to do with your marital and family destiny. There is somebody God is designed for you to be with. There is a family God wants you to have. But again, to be able to walk in those 
blessings and purposes of God, you need to go to that tree, which is Jesus, to discover his purpose for you in the area of family and marriage. And you need to go to him for him to reveal to you what is your tree that is good for food. Listen, you could make a, a six figure a year and still not be happy. You could make so much money and still not feel fulfilled. You become fulfilled even in that mega income you make when you discover your purpose. So your purpose is not really in the abundance of wealth or money. It's in you fulfilling divine purpose. I know I've spoken so much, but then again, the key thing is being able to identify that you have a threefold purpose, spiritual purpose, financial purpose, and family and marital purpose. And all these purposes when discovered becomes the place you begin from. It means until I discover what God has for me in these three areas, whatever I'm pursuing, I'm in the wrong. Okay. Mm. Okay, so then off that, I have a quick question, which is, is it possible to have identified your purpose in one or two of these three folds, but not have figured it out in one one component? Or, or, or So like, Maybe you figured out your spiritual purpose, but you can't seem to figure out your career, even though that seems like unlikely. I feel like it's possible. Or let's say that like your career seems to be going good, like you said, but like you can't seem to figure out maybe the family aspect of it, or there's a lot of turmoil with it. Is it possible for only like one of your purposes to be fulfilled at a time or are they all like occurring simultaneously? Good question. I believe the best of God is for us to be able to fulfill all threefold destiny simultaneously but like you rightly said uh sometimes we are skewed towards uh a certain particular area of our life you could see people that are career minded they are highly motivated in their career and don't want to have anything to do with church or ministry even though they are mm. christians so they will spend all their time chasing after money career building accolades for themselves because that is where their passion is and for some you know it's more about competing with their peers I want to go to the peak of, you know, academic pursuit. And so all my friends are pursuing excellence in academics. So I put all my energy into that at the expense of my spiritual life. And even some people will pursue career at the, at the expense of their marriage because you, you will see people struggling in their relationship. There are people that are not even married. They are possibly dating or having a relationship, but because they are so much focused, uh, they, they give no attention to the person they find themselves in a relationship with. There are people that are married, uh, they, they will finish their eight to five, go to another job part time, get home when the kids are sleeping, wake up when the kids are still sleeping and still go to uh, the next job, never get enough time with a family. So even though they seem to be successful financially and in career, their families are broken apart. So you're right. Mm -hmm. It's possible to be successful in one area and to be struggling in the other areas and it all has to do with you not living a balanced life god expects mm -hmm. you to have balance in whatever you do mm -hmm. thank you um our next question is what are the effects of starting well on making progress so how does starting well affect like your overall progress so, so uh, of course, if I start well, and again, starting well, like I said, I always spoke about one thing you could do, but there are a bunch of things you got to be doing to start well. You know, preparation is crucial to ending well. So, of course, if I'm not starting well, I do not have the right tools, and I'm not well prepared for the journey. You know how the Lord puts it? He says, how many of you intending to put up a building will not count the cost. He said, if you don't count the cost, the only thing that is gonna happen is that you're gonna start and within the shortest possible time, it might seem as if you're doing well, but because you did not plan for the foundation, you did not plan for the bricks, you did not plan for the roof, you never thought that after putting a roof, you now have to think about, you know, the, the um, you know, finishing the building off with the interior, the decor, you never considered furniture, you never considered appliances, you never considered all the other things that goes with a building. Bible says because of that halfway into you building that structure, 
you will give up. And people passing around will say, look at that guy. He started this project and he was never able to finish it. Why? Because he did not count the cost. And so most people don't finish well because they do not anticipate what could potentially happen along the way. Of course, the first thing I said is that you must know your purpose. Where do I intend to go? What is the vision? Where do I want to go with this? And of course, once I know how far I want to go, then now I want to sit down and count the cost. What is going to take me from point one to point 15? If my goal is to get to point 15, then I want to make sure that there is enough resources available that would take me from point number one to point number 15. And for the most part, we never get to 15 because we never count the cost, we never prepared, we never anticipated the challenges and the pitfalls that may come along the way. And that is where we end up, you know, giving up. Thank you. I guess maybe besides knowing your purpose, what are some, uh, like, how else can you arm yourself to start well? So um, sometimes the vision itself, the vision we have is a recipe for failure. So, so this is what I believe. I believe that visions must be broken into goals. Vision is a big thing. Where do you want to be in the next 25 years? That's a huge thing. I'm not going to have a vision for 25 years. I want to bro break the vision into smaller goals. It means that this is where I want to be in the next five years, but I'm go going to break it down into a yearly goal. So year one, this is what I want to accomplish out of the five-year plan. All right? In the next five years, I want to be able to own five rental income properties. But... You know what? I want to make sure that year one, I'm able to acquire one. Year two, I want to be able to acquire one more. Year three, I want to get a third. And by year four, I have my fourth. And by year five, I'm on my way to acquiring my fifth income property. But how do I start? So year one, I tell myself, you know what? I'm going to make sure that my credit is fixed. My credit report is up to par. I want to make sure that I've saved enough in year one for a down payment on my first income property. I want to make sure that I'm um, to be able to save the kind of uh, deposit I need. I've done my due diligence. The first property I want to own is going to cost me 500000 and I need at least 10% in uh, down payment and closing costs. So 10% is going to be 50000 So year one, I want to make sure that I have a job that will give me enough income so that I could save enough to have my down payment uh, you know, to buy my first income property. Now, how do I accomplish that? And that is where what I call smart goals come in. You don't just set goals. You don't just say, that, you know what, I want to lose some weight. I want to save some money. No, saving some money and losing some weight don't mean anything. It has to be smart goal. And smart goal is just an acronym. S simply means specific. How much specifically do you want to save? So in you setting up smart goal, the acronym S-M-A-R-T, S means being specific. How much weight? I want to lose 15 pounds. That is being specific. I want to save $5,000. That is you being specific. The S in SMART. M means measurable. Whatever goal I'm setting must be measurable. If you say some weight, how do you measure it? Some money, how do you measure it? What goal you set must be measurable. There must be a way to measure. That is the only way I can tell myself by July that, you know what, I said I wanted to save 5000 is July. I've saved $300. There is no way I'm going to make this 5000 by the end of the year. It is measurable. The A in SMART means attainable. If the whole year I'm not making income, I don't have a job, how do I think I'm going to attain it? Or better still, I'm making $300 a week, $1,200 a month, $14,400 a year. And I tell myself I want to save $20,000 by the end of the year. Is it my fate? Even with faith, Bible says without works, it's dead. So how do I make $14,000 a year and tell myself God has 
anointed me and this year I'm going to save 20,000. That is unattainable. Specific, measurable, attainable. Your goal must be attainable. If it is not attainable, you're deceiving yourself. And then the R in smart is the word realistic. You got to be realistic with yourself. It took you 20 years to put on 80 pounds. And you want to lose that 20 pounds in 60 days. 80 pounds in 60 days. You're not being realistic. That is how you're going to be frustrated and eventually give up on this goal you are setting for yourself. Have a realistic goal. I want to lose 15 pounds in a month. It is basically you saying that I want to lose less than two pounds at a time. I mean, 15 pounds in a year. That is you saying, I want to lose less than two pounds in a month. That looks somehow more realistic than you saying, I'm going to lose 80 pounds in 30 days. You're not being realistic. So that is the R in uh, smart goal. And then, of course, the T means set time. T means time. Put time to it. When do you want to accomplish it? When do you want to save the $5,000? Well, I want to make sure that by December ending, I have $5,000. I want to make sure by July ending, I've lost 10 pounds. You are putting time to that goal. So for a goal to really work, it got to be a smart goal. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and you got to put time to it. That is the only way that vision broken down into smaller goals are going to be accomplished. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess on the time point, I've heard of SMART goals. Time is something that I've really been talking about with my friends, like as we talk about New Year's, as we talk about how we're getting older or whatever. And can you talk about, in your experience or your understanding, the dangers of maybe allowing too much time for you to set, like to, for you to achieve a goal or um, an objective that you've set. I feel like a lot of the time we talk about um, shedding too short of time and not like extending ourselves the grace of like leniency with time. But like, I want to talk about like briefly the dangers of when you give yourself too much time to get something done. That, that is a very good question, Candice. You know, um, many years I worked in the hospitality industry, and I remember in, in the early days we had gone to one of the conferences and uh, we had a speaker from Holland, you know, teaching us about our products. And um, there were basically three products we sell in a hotel. One is uh, beverage, the other is food, and the third is accommodation. These are the only three main things we sell in the hotel industry because we have also restaurants. And then he posed a question. He said, what is the most perishable among our three products, food, beverage, and accommodation? People were just arguing. Some said food. Others said, you know, beverage. Some came, they argue, you know, with beverage. Beverage couldn't be the most perishable because if a drink is not drunk, you could put it in a fridge and sell tomorrow. Others said, well, but even with a food, you could keep it in a fridge as long as it's kept at the right temperature and sell it tomorrow. Nobody mentioned the accommodation because the room is not going to perish. It's not perishable. Then this guy stood up and said, you are all wrong. The most perishable of our products is the hotel room. Because any food that is not sold today, you could keep it and sell it tomorrow. Any beverage that is not sold, any drink that is not sold today, you could keep it and sell it tomorrow. But you know what? If a room is not sold today, tomorrow is another day that room must also be sold so the revenue you never got yesterday you cannot recoup it because tomorrow comes another day where that room also got to be sold i say this to say that the most perishable thing god has given you is your time yesterday is gone you will never get yesterday again but think about it this way we are given 24 hours in a day Averagely, we spend eight hours in a day sleeping. The average person sleeps eight hours a day. Now, eight hours simply means a third of the day. A third of the day we sleep. Is that correct, Candace? That, that is obviously the average time. Now, what that simply means is that if a third of each day we are sleeping, by the time we turn 60 years, a third of it would have been 20 years. We would have been sleeping for 20 years. Mm -hmm. 
Now think about it this way. If for 20 years you are sleeping and the average, we finish high school, uh, but associate degree, by the time we're done with our associate is 20 years. So if 20 years you're sleeping and 20 years you are in school, how much are you left with? And that is the mindset we got to have when we think about time and treat urgent things as urgent things. Let me spend some time browsing a little bit on Instagram. I want to spend some time on IG, Snapchat, Facebook, kill time, one video reels after reels after reels. Before you know, four hours is gone just watching crazy and silly videos. And that is purpose and destiny wasting away. So my thoughts on time, the biggest thief of time is called procrastination. Don't mm -hmm. procrastinate. Prioritize, especially as we come in into this new season, know the things that are important and prioritize those things that are important. Never you procrastinate those things that are important. It's so funny how sometimes we will procrastinate things that are important and the only reason we procrastinate important things is because we have a party to go, we want to watch a movie, we want to do something fun, but we fail to recognize that whilst we procrastinate and spend time watching those videos, those people that made videos whilst we are watching are making money. That is what we don't realize. So fight procrastination and use your time effectively and wisely. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that that kind of works in hand with our next question, which is what are the practical steps that we should take or keep in mind at the start of the new year and as we're beginning to, I guess, maybe like redefine what our goals are for the year? So, so for me, I think one of the biggest struggles we struggle with is our inability to um distinguish things that are important things that are necessary and things that are not necessary at all being able to distinguish between them and <clears throat> you know being very very firm <clears throat> excuse me we've been able to make a firm decision on things that are important and things that are not and being able to stand on the side of the things that are important and following through to the end with those things and we're not allowing things that are unimportant to bump into the things that we know are very important that we got to go through them and bring them to the end uh, most of the time we shortchange ourselves when we hit roadblocks you know you're taking a course uh, it becomes challenging or you you end up with a professor that seems to be frustrating your life you you quickly tell yourself you know what I, I think i'm not going to pursue this course anymore i'm going to change and do something better and and mm -hmm. in the short term we kind of think that well we might end up with a better professor or uh, this course we're always looking for an easy way out there is nothing like that whatever purpose you choose for your life that purpose is going to be tested when you are confronted with challenges actually testing you to really figure out whether you are really up for this and most of the time people give up because they were really not up for it and that is the purpose of testing testing is supposed to test whether you are really determined to go all the way through to the end and most of the time people give up. you know how the bible puts it when a man falls in a day of adversity he's a poor specimen mm -hmm. <laughs> when you fall in the days of adversity bible says you are a poor specimen and that is what challenges are meant for to test whether you really cut for this are you really cut for what you said you're going to pursue and that is where a lot of people give up but if you are really sold out for what you intend to do no challenge will stop you in your track you will break through you will pursue after it you will go all the way regardless of the challenges that may come up but then for the most part we don't expect to have challenges because we are passionate about no everything you choose you will be confronted with challenges and if you are truly uh, built for it, cut for it, and ready for it. No matter the challenges, you will you will still pursue after your passion. Thank you. Um, how can we ensure that we don't lose focus in the course of the year, and in the course of us pursuing our goals? 
So there were a bunch of things uh, we need to do. I think the key thing is for us to, first of all, discover ourselves, because some of us don't know ourselves. We know the things that easily pulls us out of our passion. We know the things that easily kills our passion. We know the things that easily kills our zeal. I mean, I don't know, Candice, if you've ever been to any of this multi-level kind of um, conferences where you go, you are being introduced to a product or service, and the presenter comes in, he's fired up, he gives you all the rundown, how you can recruit uh, a team, how you can sell the product, and how if you follow through and you give yourself a 90-day challenge, you will quickly uh, come into a place of becoming a director, a manager, or whatever, and instantly with three people under you, they're doing the same thing you just did, you would instantly become a 100,000 income Anna, and you are fired up in that conference you leave that conference and you feel as if you're going to hit the ground running and in fact for the most part you tell yourself you know what I, I know already three people i'm going to talk to i'm going to recruit them and i know the people i'm going to sell the product to i'm going to do it and i know this year i'm going to hit that hundred thousand dollar mark you feel so fired up the first <laughs> person you the product to tells you you are crazy it's not going to happen <laughs> the next person you talk to is, ah, I'm not ready for it. By the time you speak to six people and they all give you this negative thing, instantly the fire in your guts suddenly disappear. And you're like, no, this is not for me. I'm not going to do it. I feel frustrated. But that is what happens with every purpose and every vision we have for ourselves in every season. So you must know yourself. What is it that kills your vision every time? For some of you, it's the people you hang around with. They discourage you. For some of you, it's the people that speak negativity into your mind. For some of you, you yourself, you are the one that sells yourself out of your own vision. I've always said that nobody can convince you better than yourself. In fact, for the most part, all the wrong decisions you gave yourself, you got yourself engaged in, you were there when you were convincing yourself. You were the one that sold yourself that bunch of lies. In fact, after people told you that this is the way to go, you were the final person that signed off that indeed this is good. How many times haven't you convinced yourself that, you know what, that even sometimes when you are not sure, you still convince yourself. So why can't we be like David? Bible says David encouraged himself. Because those challenges are going to come this year. Uh, those naysayers are going to come this year. Those haters are going to come this year. But are you able to convince yourself? Because you have the Holy Spirit inside you. You have the Spirit of God inside you. You don't need anything externally to motivate you. The greatest of motivators is in the inside of you. And I'm talking about the Holy Spirit who is resident in you. So you've been able to distinguish your naysayers, your haters, and in fact, you. And how you are able to convince yourself out of your own purpose, you want to be a man and a woman that is able to depend on the Holy Spirit to self-motivate, self-encourage, and in fact, deny yourself of relationship that will cause you to give up on your purpose. And that is where we mostly fail. We still hang out with the same people. We still go sharing our purpose with people that will cause us to lose confidence in the things we are seeking to do. And we know them very well, but we still gravitate towards them until they discourage us again. This year, you want to do something different. Walk away from them. Don't share those purposes with them. I don't know of anybody that gives birth to a baby and suddenly brings the baby out. Nobody does that. And so it's your vision. Your vision is like a baby. Every mother giving birth to a baby will keep the baby in a room until a set time when the baby is now grown enough before they expose the baby to the elements, the sun, the moon, the rain the weather, all these people out there. But some of us don't know how to hide and flourish. I want to tell you something the Bible talks about. Bible says we must be as wise as a serpent. A good number of people think that a serpent has to do with a devil. The snake is the devil because the devil came to the Garden of Eden and deceived the woman. And so anytime we hear the word serpent or snake, the only thing we can think about is the devil. But no, 
The serpent also represents God. We know the devil has not created anything before. The best the devil can do is to pervert that which God created. And it is God that created the snake. And so, of course, the devil entered a snake and did whatever he wanted to do. But that doesn't make the snake a devil. Just like in the kingdom today, there are people that the devil would even work through them. Like Jesus one time looked at Peter and didn't call him Peter. He said, Satan, get thee behind me because the devil was operating through Peter at that time. Why am I saying that? Because there was a time that snakes came into the camp of the children of Israel and beat them and they were dying. When Moses went to God, you know what God told him? God said, I want you to take brass and make a shape of a snake and put on a rod. And anybody that goes bitten by the snake, when they look at that rod, that is made into the shape of a snake. When they look at that snake, they will be healed. Translation, we know there is a venom in snakes that kills you when you are bitten by a snake and the venom is released. But then we know that the cure for snake venom is also snake serum. There is a serum that is taken out of the snake that is supposed to heal you. So even though you got bitten by the snake, you got delivered by the snake. And that snake that brought healing and kept them from not dying was not a devil. It was the power of God. So when God says that as children of God, we should go to the snake and learn of the snake, a few things I want to tell you about the snake, Sister Candice and all the people that are listening. There is so much God wants us to learn about a snake. The snake has so many attributes. The snake is the only creature that has no limbs, no legs, no hands, but it can stand up. A snake can stand up with no legs, revealing to us that if we truly go to the snake, we can shut up and refuse to use our disabilities as a reason why we can't do the things God is calling us to do. Snake has no leg. It can go like that and stand. So you cannot use your disability as an excuse. Snake, I have seen a snake dive and fly with no wings. A snake can be in water and swim with no hands, no limbs. So your disability, when God says go to the serpent and learn of its ways, you cannot use your disability as an excuse not to do the things God is telling you to do. But this is the zinger. This is the kicker. When Bible says go to the serpent and land, do you know that snake is the only creature that can live in the same house with you for years and you will never find them? A snake in your house as a baby snake knows what time you go out. It knows what time you come in. A snake, no matter how hungry it is, if you are in that house for a week, and I know it's getting creepy right now, <laughs> me saying what I'm saying right now. A snake can be in a house with you for a week. If you are, you've not gone out of that house for a week, the snake is not going to come out, even if it's hungry. It's not going to come out to look for food. And so if the Bible says go to the snake and learn of its ways, God wants you to know how to hide and flourish. The snake knows how to hide and flourish. A snake might not come out, even if it's starving to death, and it knows that you are in a house, it's never going to come out. That is why sometimes somebody suddenly see a 12-foot snake and says, how did it get in here? It's been living with you all these years. It knew how to hide and flourish. And a lot of believers don't know how to hide the purpose, the vision God has given them for 2023 until they flourish. And so there are a lot of people with arrows that are ready to shoot down your purpose. They are ready to shoot down your vision. There are even dates, relationship, that you need to shut up until that relationship is consolidated. Sometimes we get giddy. We get excited. I'm dating this guy. You want all your friends to know. And before you know, everything has gone down because you don't know how to hide and flourish. I hope this helps somebody. Mm -hmm. I think it's helping me. Thank you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we had some messages come in. <laughs> we had some messages come in while you were talking. So I wanted to make sure that I don't miss anything Um, as like I've lost some of the messages. But we've gotten some greetings, some happy New Year's that I caught earlier. Um, And one question that came in that was, can you change your year goals in the middle of the year? And somebody also agrees that it's helping them a lot. So, yeah. All right, yeah. track. Amen. Well, um, the, the question is, can you change your goals in the middle of the year? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, my answer to that is very simple. It, it's is the is the epitome of craziness for you to think you can continue doing the same thing and hopefully get a different result. If you're right. doing the same thing from January to July and the results are the same and it's not the results you're looking for, come on. Can I tell you something, Candice? Long time ago, I realized that the most expensive thing to keep is a dead body. No matter how you love a person, if the person is dead, there are only two things you could do. Put them in a a coffin and bury them. Anything that is dead, you got to bury them. And being a pastor, I have not been afraid and not felt ashamed. Having started a ministry in a church and that ministry is not working well, I shut it down, I close it, I kill it, and I bury it. I don't say, oh, what will people think about me that I started this group in a church and it's not working? I will feel ashamed, I will feel disgrace. I will bury it. Because the most, the only way I can sustain that group is to embalm it. It is dead. It's so expensive to buy embalmment. And with time, if I can afford the embalmment, that thing is going to stink. That group is going to stink. It's going to be repulsive. Nobody will want to have anything to do with it. So what do I do? Bury it. That purpose, that vision you began in January, you thought that was it? There is no shame. I've done business. I tell you, one of the saddest business I did, I pumped in so much money. And I tell you what, I had gone so deep into that business. I had invested so much money. And I'm like, let me put more money. Let me put more money. And the more I put money to it, the worse the business became. Then I realized that financially I was bleeding. And if I didn't stop the bleeding, I was only going to die. And some of us need to know when to stop the bleeding. Cut that bleeding. Cut that dead. Some of us need to know when to cut it off. It's done. Cut, cut your losses. It's a loss. It's a mm. loss. No matter how much you throw at it, that thing is dead. Nothing is going to come out of it. So you got to learn how to cut losses. Some of you need to cut your losses in relationship. Oh, but I've gone so deep with this guy. We've dated for two oh. and a half years. It's time wasted. Cut it. Cut your losses. Cut the bleeding. There is nothing wrong with that. There is no shame. You're not in that relationship to please anybody. If it doesn't please me, I'm not going to live in it. God doesn't want you to endure yeah. relationship. He wants you to enjoy relationship. And so I'm not going to stay in it and endure whilst everybody is happy, whilst I'm enduring in that relationship. I'm not going to be in it to make others happy. I got to be fulfilled in it. And the fact that we spent three years and it didn't work doesn't obligate me to continue to live that craziness with that guy or that craziness and that tantrum with that girl. I can cut it off. Yeah. So, brother, if by July you think it's not working, change it. There is no mm. shame in it. Okay, so then I have a question on that. Just because, like, th- luckily my problem or my stressors in life are not, like, relationships with people, but with just, like, the different, I maybe, I responsibilities I've taken on, like fellowship groups, like things that I'll try, or, like like, career goals or pet projects that I'll try to start. I have a problem sometimes. I like was even making a joke to my friend that I feel like I pray for patience a lot. And then every time God puts me in an, in a um, scenario where I have to like practice patience, I'm very quick to be like, you know what? I want to throw in the towel and quit. Like if it's a career, I would have like prayed for the job for a long time, finally get it. And I'm like, actually, like, I don't like the way people are treating me or this assignment. I like the way that like the hierarchy is set up or the way that the rules work is not what I thought it was. And maybe this is a sign that I should leave as opposed to like, maybe I should stick it out. So I guess in that regard, like, how do you make the... um Where do you draw the line between something that's supposed to discourage you and when it's time for you to cut your losses and try something new or refocus your energies? So are are we specifically talking about ministry or business or relationship? It could be career-wise. I'm talking outside of relationship because I feel like just now the answer that you gave was solely focused on like relationships. So maybe outside of the relationship context in terms of maybe a professional goal that you set, um, a, a fellowship group, for instance, or ministry that you brought up that you said, for instance, if you start a group and it's dead, then like you'd much rather just cut your losses and actually start again when you feel like you have it together as opposed 
um, to he- to caring what people think about you. So I guess in both the ministry and the career respects, how would you apply what you just said? So, so uh, when it comes to ministry and career, this is how I look at it. Now, when you do in ministry, uh, we, we do ministry based on the model of Jesus. Jesus said, I did not come to be saved. I came to save. So ministry has nothing to do with we being saved. We are in ministry to save people. And so this is my principle. If I am to be serving, then of course, just like Bible says, the Lord is a tree, we are the branches. And we know the fruits grow on the branches and not a tree. So the fruits, that is why we got to have the fruits of the spirit. Whatever God is giving you and me, all of us for the purposes of serving humanity from mm-hmm. the church, the four walls of the church and even beyond. What God is giving us to serve is never intended to be for our benefit. And I explained that. Now, I have never seen any tree eat of its own fruits. The fruits mm. must be eaten by others. It means whatever God gave you was not for you. It was intended for others. So, so here, it's totally different from when you have begun a group and now you know the group is not working and you got to shut it down and begin again, reevaluate, and then uh, know when to take it, take, take off from. I'm talking about when you are serving within a group, you don't have mm-hmm. the uh, authority to, you know, end a group or whatever, but you are in there serving in that group. There are things that are going to happen that are unpleasant. And I, I want to mm-hmm. give you an illustration of the unpleasant things that are happening. And this has nothing to do with abuse. Abuse is a no-no. But I'm talking about you having issues with the way people pluck the fruit out of the tree. You can't control mm-hmm. that. People are going to pluck. People are going to eat. In fact, the reason yeah. why people are chewing and eating so much of you is because you have juicy fruits. You are so fruity. You are so juicy. And that is, it means you got some good stuff. That is why people want to eat of your fruit. And so we should not be tired. And that is why Bible says, do not be tired of well-doing. Because if you do not get tired in due season, you shall receive your reward. It means there is something good in you and about you and from you that people are receiving that they can't stop receiving. So that is supposed to be a positive. And I'm I'm not talking about when people are being abusive and abusing the fruit. Of course, we don't want anybody to come to our garden and, and pluck the trees and stamp on them and just pluck them and throw them away and turn them into balls and games and what have you. We want people to use the gift for productive purposes. So if you are in an environment where people are taking your gift for granted and abusing a gift of God that is given to you, uh, then that is when you got to gauge when God is speaking to you otherwise. Because you know what? People who abuse you, they abuse Jesus. In fact, Bible says that Jesus couldn't do much miracles in his hometown. And he concluded, the reason is familiarity. He concluded by saying that a prophet is not honored in his own country. And that is so evident in every place where people are familiar with you, it becomes difficult for them to receive of your fruit. And so uh, I, I I hope I answered the question you had. Yes, thank you, thank you again, Praise Pastor Shelton. Amen. Um, we had a question come in. I just lost sight of it. Hold on. Oh, we had a question from our sister Shernet, which is, how do we stay motivated? Mm-hmm. Praise God. First Lady Shanet, I didn't know you were on. God bless you. Thank you so very much for being here. <laughs> How do we stay motivated? Now, I'll tell you a few things you could do. Um, when you truly find your passion, you know, one of the passions I had growing up was uh, table tennis, what we call ping pong here. I could play table tennis for 15 hours nonstop, and I'm not kidding. I was crazy about it. I remember one time we were playing ping pong and and the ball went behind the wall. And to go around the house and go behind the wall to go pick up the ball, for me, would have taken me maybe two minutes. But that two minutes was too long a break to stop playing. I decided to scale the wall. And the scaling the wall, that wall back in those days, we had broken bottles that were used on top of the wall. And I scaled over it and I got the bottles sticking into my hands. 
And I didn't care. I still scaled and scaled back. And when I came back, I was bleeding. They had to get me to the hospital to get doctors to stitch my hand. Guess what? When I came back, I began playing with my left hand. That was how come the only thing I could do with both hands was playing ping pong. It was so bad at a point I wanted to beat certain people. I had to use my right hand in stitches. The stitches tore through. You could see it. That It's still there. You could see it. It tore through because I couldn't stay out of that passion. It was such a strong passion. But that is what happens when you truly discover your place of passion, the place God has called you to. And I will tell you the distinction between your job and your work. Bible never says, do you see a man who is diligent in his job? He says, do you see a man diligent in his work? You see, your job is what you go to school to learn. Your work is yeah. what you are born with. Two different things. Your job is what you are hired to do. Your work is what God gave to you. With your job, <laughs> you get paid. But with your work, you determine how much you earn. You see, um, your job, you can be fired, but nobody can fire you from your work. Now, I wanted to think about it. With your job, you retire. But with your work, it goes with you. <laughs> you see, your job, your children cannot inherit. But your work, your children can inherit. It means you could pass on your work as an inheritor. There is a big distinction between the two. And what will motivate you is when you truly discover your work. This is what God created me to do. And your work can be even hidden in your job because Bible says whatever work you are doing, do it as though you were working for God. So even though you are hired to do that eight to five, you're not working for that boss. You are working for God. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so you don't become an eye pleaser. You put up all your best when the boss is around and when it's not around, you just do anything anyhow. Yeah. No. If you are working for God, you understand that God is there when the boss is not there. And so you know God is watching when the boss is not watching. And that becomes your source of motivation. You are not working for man. You are working for God. And number two, you understand that work or job is not just job or work. It is a ministry. Ministry <laughs> comes from a Greek word called diakonos. Diakonos, out of it, we have the word deacon. And deacon simply means somebody called to serve. So if you're a deacon, it's not a title to feel all big about it. You are just a servant. You are there to serve. And so wherever you are, you are just a bank teller. But then in the sight of God, you are a servant. You are there to serve. What that simply means is that when you get at, at, the, at that counter, you want the world to know how it feels like when Jesus is the one that is the teller. When you are a teacher taking a class, you want the, the kids to know how it feels like when Jesus is the one giving the lesson that morning. And so staying motivated, like First Lady Shanet asks, it is you, first of all, understanding why you're doing what you are doing. If you are doing it because you know that this is what God has called me to do, the Holy Spirit becomes your source of motivation. I don't need a pay increase to stay motivated. Because those little material things could create motivation, but your greatest motivation must be in God. I'm doing this because I'm doing it unto the Lord. When you stay connected to the Holy Spirit and the source who is God, you are perpetually motivated. You are perpetually encouraged. Even when that boss is not being nice to you, you look past that because you know what? It is about the kids that are going to benefit from your work that you do. It is the people that are going to show up on Monday morning in that office who you are going to serve that you consider as the people God has planted you there to serve rather than the boss that is not treating you nice. That is how you stay motivated in the midst of all the challenges they, that might confront you in your day-to-day -day work at that working environment. So for me, my greatest motivation is first of all understanding that this whole thing, I'm not doing it for men, I'm doing it for God. And number two, depending on the Holy Spirit to strengthen me, when people are being ugly and nasty to me, the Holy Spirit continually grant me this motivation in the inside of me that causes me to continue doing the things God has called me to do. The Holy Spirit, 
will be your greatest source of motivation. But of course, there are a lot of natural things you could do. When you know you are burnt out, take time off. Because when you are burnt out, there is nothing you could do. You cannot give what you don't have. Know when to take a break. Know when to rest. Know when it is time to say, you know what, I'm done for the day. I can't do anymore. Jesus was God, but he knew when to pull from the crowd. And I tell you what, the time Jesus pulled from the crowd is the time most people will not pull from the crowd. Can you imagine you just ministered to 5,000 people, the crowd, and not only that, you just prayed over five loaves and three fishes and miracles happened. Thousands of people are following you. And that is the time you say, I'm going on vacation, I need time off. But that is the time Jesus took time off just to teach us that even at the peak of success, it's okay to pull off. If you feel bent out in that church, in that ministry, whatever you are doing, go to pastor and pastor, you know what? I know there is nobody here, but I also believe that Jesus said, I will build my church. So I cannot stop God's show. If I am off the cast, God will still take care of. But pastor, in the next three months, I want to prepare somebody to take over. You also don't want to be uh, uh, irresponsible. You want to be like David who left his few sheep in the care of somebody when he was sent to even bring food to his siblings. So you want to prepare somebody in, in, in preparation for you to take time off so that you can refresh yourself and come back. These are all part of things we could be doing to stay motivated. Amen. Thank you, Apostle Shoulders. Um, and thank you, um, First Lady Charnette for the question. I'm gonna check once more to see if any other questions came in. Okay, no, we're good. So that would seem, it would seem like that question kind of, I, you you would define motivation and losing focus as like one and the same, right? Pretty much. Right? Yeah, okay, so I think that that covers that question. Um, and then that brings us to our last question of the evening, which is, is there such thing as it being too late to start planning? And how does one redeem time that is lost or make, make up for time lost if possible, if at all? So a lot of people <clears throat> make worse decisions when they feel they've run out of time. And that is where it even gets dangerous. Well, you are 58 years. I'm like, I'm almost retirement and I haven't done the right choices in life. So you will see people rather uh, taking time to make cautious decisions. They're like, you know what? I got to get it big once and for all. I can't do anything small and start small. One thing we should realize that we can never break kingdom principles. Bible says, do not despise humble beginnings. And that principle of humble beginnings is not tied to age. It means that God is not going to bend over because you are 60 years to change that principle. That principle works for you when you are 18. It works for you when you are 40. And it will work for you when you are as old as Abraham. God didn't say, because Abraham, you got into the game of having babies late. I'm going to give you a quadruplet. No, he didn't. Even, he, he gave him one child at a time. I'm just trying to help somebody who is getting ready to pull all his 401k, all his lifetime savings into one activity that he feels that this is going to be the banger. I'm going to hit it yeah. big and make up for all the time loss. It's not going to happen. It's going to give you a heart attack and it might send you to your grave quicker. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. Now, you cannot change the principles of God. Whether you are 60, you are 70, I tell you, if you feel you've missed it, what you need to do is to retrace your steps back to God. And God, who knows that you've lost some time, he knows how to hasten that which concerns you. And he promises to do a quick work, but it begins with you starting off on the right foot. And the right foot is called humble beginnings. Regardless of how old you are, go back to the basics again and begin to do the things you were supposed to do 20 years ago that you failed to do. And when you get it right, God knows how to magnify your effort. 
God knows how to amplify your effort. God knowing that now you have come back home, you are doing the right thing, you are in the right place. He knows how to now suddenly move you from one to ten. But brothers and sisters, you got to come to one. Don't say because I've lost time, I'm going to start from eight. You don't say I'm going to suddenly build a skyscraper, but I don't care about a foundation because the days of building foundation is over. You have heard me say time and again, those of you that have been listening to me, that you can never build a skyscraper purpose, vision, a skyscraper, you know, uh, whatever you are building as a skyscraper, you cannot build it over a chicken coop foundation. So you can't skip foundation because you feel you've lost time. Well, my purpose is to build a skyscraper. But if you say, because I'm 60 years old, I got no time to build foundation. Guess what? That skyscraper, no matter how high you build it, is going to come down. It's going to crumble. And so people don't let the fact that you feel you've lost time cause you to do crazy stuff. Don't go crazy. Come back to the basics. Start with the Lord. Hear directly from the Lord. Let the Lord speak to you, give you clarity in your heart. And it doesn't matter. You could be as old as Abraham. God can still start with you and his purpose for your life will still come to pass. He will still make you a father of many nations, no matter how late you are. He will still give you the Isaac he promised you, no matter how old you are, as long as you come back. And remember, God never did what he said he was going to do with Abraham until Abraham got it right with God. God came to him and said, Abraham, this is my game plan for you. This is my vision. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your kindred and go to a place. I'm not ready to give you the address to punch in your GPS. Just believe me and come along with me to a place I will show you. His insecurity made him pick his nephew Lot with him. And if you read the Bible, God never spoke to him and fulfilled his purpose until finally he said, God, you know what? I think I've been doing it my own way. I'm going to let my nephew Lot go and let him take whatever he wants to take. Let him take the best of the land. Let him take the best of the place. I'm sick and tired of doing it in my own way, thinking if things don't work, I need a family member that I can depend on. I'm going to let all go, and I want to depend on you totally. It was then God's promise of Isaac happened when he let go of his insecurity of having Lot in his life. And again, he had to come back to basics. He could have still been stubborn and continued to do whatever he was doing and have Lot hanging around his life because of his insecurity and the fact that he was so old. But then when he let all these people live his life, guess what? That was when the word of God became fulfilled in his life. And God loves you so much that sometimes he knows how to stare trouble around you just to get you to do the right thing. The men of Abraham and the men of Lot began to fight. And that is what precipitated that movement where now Abraham said, you know what, enough, I'm done. Guys, pack whatever you want to take. Take the best of the land. I don't care. Whatever you choose, choose and go. All I want is for you to go because I know you are my blessing blocker. I want you to go so that I can see clearly because the moment he let him go, God came and God says, come visit with me. Let's take a tour. Let's take a walk by the beach. God asks him, what do you see when you pick your head up? He says, I see the stars. He says, I'm going to give you spiritual children that will not even be born out of your loins. They're going to be the spiritual Jewish people. You and I, we are not Jewish. We are spiritual Jewish people that have been grafted into the kingdom of God. He says, I'm going to give you because you let this guy go. I I'm going to give you spiritual children. And he says, do you see the sea sun? These are your natural born children who are going to come out of your loins beginning from Isaac. And this is going to happen because you know what? Tonight, you let this guy go and we're going to start this whole deal all over again. So don't let your insecurity make you take wrong choices. Begin with him. Begin with God. And he would order your steps. Praise God. Amen. Thank you so, so much, Apostle Shelders. Seriously, love talking with you. I love your approach and the way that you break down stuff for me to understand. I definitely have gained so much from today's conversation. Um, I might have some things to follow up on, and I hope I actually do follow up on that. <laughs> but um, I've definitely been taking notes. It was a lot to take in. Um, very grateful for all of this insight and this input. 
I'm actually going to look into like the ways of the serpent because that is something that I had not considered or that is really new to me until this conversation. Um, I think that there's a lot to learn. Um, but I don't have anything else to add for this conversation and you'll be back on Gospel City in two weeks from today to discuss um, discernment. Um, I believe the correct topic is discernment into the year of 2023 um, um, and getting your spiritual antenna on, but that will be with you in a couple weeks. So I look forward to tuning into that conversation as well. Definitely building upon what we started to discuss here today. Um, I don't know if you have any final words for me or for those of us that have joined and are viewing from home, but if you don't have any other words, I'd like to leave you with have a great evening and God bless you so much for all that you do for us. But yes, thank you. And thank you many times. Thank you very much, Sister Candice. I enjoy the time with you and uh, I look forward to our next meeting. People of God, <laughs> let's get our vision in place. Let's depend on God. By the way, I want to invite everybody listening to me to our next Legacy Life University course, which is going to be a game changer. It's called Business Models. And again, uh, the name sounds business, but then whatever it is, whether God is calling you to start a ministry, God is calling you to start a not-for-profit organization or a real business. Uh, in this class, I'm going to teach you some key things that are going to help you if you are now a startup organization or you already have something going, but you don't know how to scale. I want to help you and give you some tools that is going to help you take this whole thing to a whole new level. And this course starts from next week, Saturday. It's an eight-week program. Each section is one hour, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard. And I wanted to go right now to our, our website. It's Legacy Life U dot org legacy life you dot org and i want you to sign up it's on the screen right now business models thank you so much pastor francis for putting that up <laughs> amen all the information is right there you have the phone number in case you have any question you could call that number 888-430-8118 you could call our 1-800 number and all your questions will be answered but don't miss this class is definitely going to empower you in this new season i love you guys god bless you and thank you sister candice and the team at fbn Thank you again, Apostle Shelders. I hope you have a blessed night and a blessed week and that we have more good news to share with each other the next time we meet. But until then. Amen. Yes. Amen. God Amen. bless you. Thank you. You too. in his hands, we are all on the winning side.